Hello boys and girls. In this video we are going to go through a full set of axioms that can function as foundations of mathematics, including the logic and uh, we're going to deal with a set theory, but I will also like say how that relates to other frameworks that may function as foundations of mathematics. Um, I will pull things up uh, starting on a very constructive level, so we will end up with a sort of constructive Zermelo Frankel theory, but then we will also add uh, excluded middle um, and so on. I mostly go down that road, road because I will also talk about lambda calculus interpretation to motivate the logical laws, and it will be quite detailed. I try to get through it in one hour and 40 minutes because then I have a video call. Um, and that said, I mean, I got my hot chocolate here and some some juice. I hope uh, you are also prepared for a hundred minutes of uh, formal math. Get yourself a drink, get yourself something to, to eat. And with that said, I, su I suppose I will uh, jump right into that. So this is the text uh, that we are going to go through. Before I get into references um, and the discussion proper, uh, I will quickly step through it. Okay, so here um, is the strategy that we are going to go down in this video. I already like uh, sketched it and you will see it in a second. Um, I'm going to introduce a bunch of conventions. I, I try to be more or less encompassing. Of course, I have to do some cuts there where I would like to talk a little bit more, but uh, I want to keep it uh, under two hours. And I have also a bunch of other videos. I will show you some references. So, okay, so before we go through it, I will actually show you each of the axioms. If you're just here for the axioms, you can write them down. Then you have your, uh, your straight axiomatization of, of mathematics in your pocket. Um, we have this Hilbert style uh, calculus of proofing, which means we have this one inference rule, um, modus ponens, uh, like the, the most basic straightforward uh, rule of uh, deriving new statements. Um, and then now I will just browse through these, okay? And then afterwards I come back to them. We start with this uh, propositional logic calculus. So there are a bunch of, um, of these rules and I adopted the naming conventions from the Metamath theorem proof. Although there's a website which has like a billion of, of theorems and also various axiom systems that they investigate. Uh, I follow uh, very closely here the intuitionistic uh, bracket of the Metamath calculus. Um, I will say a little bit more about that uh, in the preliminaries later. So here are these, these axioms. Okay, I will now go a little bit faster through them. This is still just propositional logic. And with this, the, uh, like, with this, the minimal logic calculus is basically complete. I made a video about minimal logic calculus, which is this sub uh, logic of intuitionistic logic. Then you add explosion. Um, okay, that's the uh, propositional part. Then you introduce quantifiers, in particular the universal quantification, uh, also one rule, and then a bunch of um, uh, axioms, uh, like sentences taken to be true. And um, some of them are like, if you know the interpretation of the, the symbols, then this is like, uh, like uh, really obvious, um, but of course you have to axiomize them in a way that you can actually do the formal math. And these axioms are, are as they are, um, for example, in these proof verifiers. And so even the basic substitution rules have to be axiomatized. It's a little bit more formal than what you have in a, in a logic book usually. Okay, so still axioms of universal quantification uh, talk about these uh, symbols that are basically ab abbreviations in a second as well. You have the uh, existential quantifier. Then you have uh, a, a quality, um, which is I mean, usually part of the, the framework. Also very ways, a lot of ways to approach this. But uh, here are this, this rule that blend together a predicate calculus with also this the binary um, operation, the symbol. 
uh, that is equality. And, and uh, you can independently axiomatize predicate logic and, and uh, rules of equality. What in this uh, formalization that we have here already blends in is this set theoretical symbol. So this uh, is element of this membership uh, predicate of two of two variables. Um, and these are also here set up already in the in, in equational part. And then comes the set theory axioms. As I said, we start like with this very constructive approach and then only after at the more dangerous um, laws. So these are very standard here. Um, I will talk about predicativity a little bit. One month ago, I did a whole video on impredicativity where I discuss uh, separation in uh, very detailed fashion. Infinity, exponentiation slash power set, and then set induction slash uh, regularity. These are the uh, analog axioms in the standard uh, similar Frankel presentation. But uh, here, if you adopt the law of excluded middle, then we are already in the in the Semilo Frankel uh, situation. Um, axiom of choice. Then I will discuss one large cardinal axiom, one, one big one that is um, also associated with Grotendieck because it's hand comes in handy to do uh, some category theory in algebraic geometry and so on. And and then to actually like. Uh, to, to be able to say I uh, discuss all the axioms, um, I just introduced like an axiom that collapses the system and then everything is a theorem and all axioms are <laughs> adopted. <laughs> okay. The end here is more like uh, more or less a joke, but formally it's also correct. <laughs> um, okay, so then um, before I get back to the file, let me go through references, right? So. Um, here I have uh, my YouTube channel, subscribe to the channel, of course. I pointed out because uh, I had made a bunch of videos uh, in the direction of things that we're going to see in this video. For example, I have one short clip about like a very basic sketch of the Curry Howard co correspondence or you know, hating Brower Kolmogorov interpretation that will play a, a role here in this video to interpret. Um, especially the propositional uh, expressions. Um, then, uh, and I, I talked a bunch about very like uh, rudimentary set theory from a formal perspective. I talked about ordinals in this channel, uh, but then I also did uh, some more videos like more like recently in a more constructive direction. I talk about uh, the law of excluded middle, its role in these constructive frameworks, how it can be proven in this, uh, in, uh, constructive frameworks, or uh, let's rather say a classical analog to, to it. Um, I talked about the uh, constructive set theories, although in the meantime, I have completely re rewritten the constructive set theory Wikipedia article, so it has a, a lot more information now. Um, and these will also like kind of go into the um, discussion today. Um, I proved a bunch of formal things, and then I talked, for example, about this minimal logic that I quite like, um, and then recently about non-constructive principles that are not like full law of excluded middle or so, things in between, or also other logics. Uh, this lo this video, uh, like for the people who already know this, all these terms, we're just going to, of course, talk about um, uh, first order logic and what is really proven in the anal in the axioms. Uh, that we present, or at least the corresponding meta math versions of it, are like these this schemes. So I will not like elaborate too, too much on on uh, axioms versus axiom schemes in this video. This is already sort of part of, for example, the uh, impredicativity video that I did um, uh, a month ago. Um, but I will say a li little bit more about the formal stuff in a second. Okay, so um, moving on, uh, I have some recommendations if you just want to learn uh, logic in a sort of modern way. The good thing is there is this uh, there's this guy um, Stephen Simpson, 
uh, sorry, I forgot the name now, and he ha doesn't have it right on his block here. But if we jump into uh, one of those, then you'll probably see the name. Yeah, Peter Smith, that's, that's the name. Um, he has this, uh, this website where he discusses uh, books. Um, this is like a hundred paper review of uh, various books. And um, then also this uh, hundred page uh, logic guide where he gives his, his opinion on a bunch of literature and also like kind of a way to approach it for various levels. So that's the first recommendation. He's certainly there an expert and has some his opinions. Um, and he also like, oh, just as a side note, he has some books of, on Gödel's theorems, which are quite readable. Uh, then uh, a book I like uh, is this um, Logic and Structure by Dahlen. So that's one recommendation. It might even be that some university site has this book online as a PDF in, at least in a, in a, in a previous edition. Um, and then that's why I confused the names because this guy is called Simpson. There are these um, mathematical logic notes that I also really liked. Like when I, when I first learned logic a um, bunch of years ago, then I, I found these, uh, these notes and they are like, especially for these free online lecture notes, very nice. So these are my recommendations. You find all the links uh, as always in this uh, GitHub uh, GIST link in the bottom of this video. Um, okay, and then I will go through for this just 10 very related uh, Wikipedia pages. So you just have some references, things that you might want to look into in case you already, don't already know them. So uh, we start here with this um, uh, Frege, one of the heroes here, because he introduced the, the quantifiers and this, this sort of logic and many other things. And here, um, as the Wikipedia page says, uh, Frege's propositional logic, this is what we are going to start with, and for, not Frege's version, but a propositional logic, um, was this uh, first axiomatization of propos uh, propositional calculus, and that's like 150 years ago. And here you have a bunch of rules and a discussion uh, in this uh, very logic-minded, I mean, the, 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 the major, I mean, you know, logic major, the way they write down, down these things. Uh, here you have one of these, these uh, calculi uh, that is presented here, and this is the, the starting point from which things evolved. Um, I have talked about this minimal logic, which I like um, in a one hour video on this channel. We are going to cover basically the axioms that are needed for that, and then we will go on and go beyond. Um, then there are these various calculi, I already mentioned this Hilbert style thing where we have this modus ponens as rules of inference, the rules of inference as opposed to just the axioms or what I will uh, maybe sometimes call law in this video are the um, meta-logical inference rule for get, like producing new, new theorems as opposed to the axioms that make a statement in the what I will call object log, uh, you know, language. So, uh, but apart from the Hilbert style that we're going to sort of work with, there's other um, variants of calculi for logic for deriving statements. I mean, of course, all of them do like enable you to talk about the standard classical propositional calculus and then more. Um, I want to point out to highlight the natural deduction, which is very related to type theoretic presentations, for example. Um, then a little bit harder to read uh, the sequent calculus. Um, not going to go into much detail here. So it's, let's say similar to the, the natural deduction, but uh, different. Um, okay, this is the Hilbert system, a Wikipedia article that discusses this sort of uh, system that uh, like explains uh, what's going on in, in this way of uh, deducing. And it also states some, some of the axioms, but there's also this long list uh, of Hilbert systems as a separate Wikipedia page, which lists the different uh, systems that, for example, give logics and and also equivalent ways of axiomatizing this propositional calculi. Um, so here are two and you also find, I don't know, uh, these in terms of other symbols like you know, Sheffer stroke and also weaker logics are discussed here. And then poorly implicational, like these calculi that are just written down in terms of implication, although they might not then have a negation and so they cannot prove the same things. Uh, but this is a nice list of, of um, proof calculi. Um, 
where am I here? Then this is the article on first order logic, what we are also going to use um, essentially. And especially the equality axioms. I don't know if we will jump to the right. Yeah, no, it doesn't jump to the to the right section that I, that I would like him to now, but it doesn't matter too much. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that uh, at, at one point he discussed the uh, equational calculus as well. Equation is, of course, especially in the last uh, decades, a big topic, for example, for the homotopy, homotopy type theoretic uh, calculation rules or calculi rules associated with substitution in logics with, with equations and what equals means in these theories. Uh, but not even if you just uh, this modern also, also generally there's a lot of things that one can say, of course, in this video, we're going to go with a more, more or less conventional um, approach. Although since we are so formal in this video, since we're going, um, we are basically as formal as the, the Metamorph theorem, theorem prover, at least we're discussing the axioms. Uh, it's actually funny if you like very explicitly write on all these calculation rules that are more or less intuitive if you just come from school mathematics, anyhow. Um, yeah, then uh, I will explain the most of the propositional um, and also essentially the, the predicate uh, laws uh, using the brauer heiting kolmogorov interpretation. So this is this, this sort of functional interpretation. If you are interested in that, um, I will not dwell on this Wikipedia page uh, too much, but here's the interpretation. You can pause and, and read what it means. This is what I'm going to use to, to also motivate um, why the axioms that we are going to adopt are already true. Um, okay, then uh, a variant of that is the like commuter science Howard uh, Cor uh, Curry Howard correspondence on which I also have this this one video, which equates them to types. I will probably also use this this type language, and that can also then be here. You see this this extension to the predicate calculus. It will hopefully seem very intuitive the way I will use it in this video. Uh, this is of course related to the lambda calculus. We're going to use this notation. I will shortly when I start using it introduce what these things mean. Um, and I also want to point out we're going to use the substitution notation that they also use here. So where if you have an expression, uh, in this case the expression is x itself, where you say uh, consider the expression that might stand for some other expression which has some variables and then in this expression replace all instances of uh, this variable with this. this um, and so for example in, in, in the symbol which is literally x if you re replace x with r you get r um, and then the there's this basically formalizations of what it means to substitute something right you have an equation it says x squared equals 17 and then you say oh plug in for x 90 and then you, from substituting this expression to the other one you get 90 squared is 17 or whatever it says which would usually be considered a false statement in arithmetic of course okay um then another famous uh construct um, another famous like uh computational implementation of a logic which is then very powerful is the calculus of con constructions um not going to adopt it this, in this video although nevertheless it's interesting to see uh, and to always come back here to these implementations of these various connectives in this very like compact uh compact form basically they have uh, quantifiers like universal quantifiers and implications and then they define um these symbols there and as, at least if you ad adopt the classical mindset then if you think about it a little bit and it's, then these actually make sense it's very interesting um and here are also like the the existential quantifier it defined in terms of the universal one we will see something related in this video because the emphasis is more on the universal one than on the existential one in the axiomatization in the type theoretic interpretation the curry howard uh, correspondence both of them are pretty simple and pretty distinct um 
Okay, and you know, now I could talk about category theory and, and uh, categorical logic and universal quantifier and existential quantifier. Although I have a, an, a video on the dependent product as well, where I also talk about the universal quantifier. Uh, but in this video, uh, like we are going with the axioms as we see them in these more standard presentations. System F, that's uh, the, uh, the calculus underlying Haskell. Um, maybe with some layers in between. We are also going to deal with this, these uh, lambdas and maybe different different uh, sorts of things that are typed. Uh, here they also use a, similar, a variant of this notation with, the, with the, these brackets. I pointed out because in the, in the math uh, community maybe this, this notation is not as common, but you will see in a second like how you can make use of that. Uh, and here they also define basically math in using these symbols, but this is another route that we're not going to take. Uh, okay, and then uh, the page from which I've adopted the bulk of the axioms um, and also the names of the axioms. This is this Metamath uh, verifier, um, proof checker here. And there are also other, like I think the, the, the MISA theorem prover I think I also a checker um, would be, for example, an older one. Uh, although they, they they also have like this this they, they use this foundation as sort of set theory, which is very strong. They adopt the, the Tusky axiom that we are going to see at the end of this video as well. And um, but it's not as uh, arguably not as, as readable. And also the nice thing about the MetaMath um, page is that they have this dedicated section also to the intuitionistic. Uh, set theory uh, and while this is still too strong for what I uh, like to consider here at the start um, here you, you have this for example two of the this this logic explorers where they have a bunch of theorems already proven um, and they, they have like this, con this this separation between this constructive and, and non-constructive uh, proven theorems as you just saw we're not going to discuss any theorems but here um, you see a more of an explanation uh, like like in the textbook of the calculus that they are actually using you know this is uh, calculus is based on on substitution and uh, in this video like there is a lot of this like logical discussion about like things you need to worry about if you do actually formalization of logic um but i'm not going to go into much detail about you know distinct variable conditions and all this uh, very technical things. Um, I just said, don't have the time in this video. Um, but as I said, like here, they, they list these axioms in, in, in this sort of fashion, it's similar to what we are going to see here. And they have like basically everything. All, and you know, they, not just the axiom systems, but then they also prove uh, like how, how to get to alternative axioms from these axioms and, and these kind of things are on this side. Okay. So, um, through with the videos, 20 minutes in, uh, let's start now with this, the text that we're going to go through. Um, I think I've explained uh, already the approach that we're going to take. Um, the conventions, uh, like there's not too much surprising. They are used as like standard uh, letters. Um, these will be um, generally set variables. Um, so long as we don't talk about sets yet in the propositional part, you can think of them as just the elements in the domain of this course, the things that are being talked about, but keep in mind that we're eventually going to talk about uh, sets, right? You could also write down with the same uh, like predicate calculus, the theory of groups, and then this would be um, groups that are not uh, like group elements, for example, that are not uh, necessarily sets. Uh, but in this approach that we're going to take the standard, you know, foundations of math approach where everything is a set and everything there's not a, like conceptually a set, it's just modeled with sets. You think of them as sets. And uh, we will see like uh, sets that are functions and but that of course, I mean the model of functions in set theory, which would be like this set of pairs, which may make up for a graph and so on and so forth. Um, and then the um, propositional um, variables that may depend on uh, set parameters, like th these might, uh, like I will use them as, as ranging over all these the propositions 
And then I might, might say, oh, if you con consider a particular proposition, then this I will denote this by, by this, this capital T that will show up in a lot of like examples, will not be part of the formal axioms, but just in my, you know, the way I'm explaining things. And um, we are not going to use any like argument brackets, mostly because uh, the MetaMath presentation also doesn't do that um, and to, to like have the comparison and to enable you to go to the web page and see how things are proven, for example, from these axiom systems completely formally. I, st I, still, uh, I stick very close, like not 100%, but very close to this, this framework. Um, and again, this, um, this uh, propositions or predicates might depend on, on parameters and, and there, uh, there are a bunch of axioms, like especially the ones for substitution, which um, are formal axioms exactly to deal with this sort of um, issue that you have some variable that also depends on other variable and maybe some typing issues and, and whatnot. Okay. Um, then informally, I will talk about proofs. And if you uh, talk uh, about proofs as objects, like in, uh, in Lambda calculus, for example, then I have to, I want to give to a name, for example, to proofs or proof variables, and this will be the small p. Um, okay. I have a video on set builder notation, class notation. I'm um, not going to explain this, it's for the time's sake. Um, and then here you see some other conventions that I adopt, okay? Uh, this is also completely standard, so the B implication is impl this implication plus this implication. What implication and end mean and these symbols, this is the, the matter of this video, we will define this. Uh, but here, like if you say this, you can in your head think of them replaced with, with these expressions. Um, and then you know, unique, um, unique quantifiers and universal quantifiers, existential quantifiers that are bounded, you know, you see a bounded universal quantification and say for all X, uh, not, not all X that exist in the domain of this course, but just those that are in the set A, right? Okay, and then um, I have this symbol that, uh, like this is also like more of a formal symbol. If you do, if you do like normal textbook mathematics, which is not as formal, then uh, these things like substitution are either swept under the rug or really they are like simple enough to do like at least on pen, pen and paper. But as we are a little bit more formal here, we have to, to deal with this, you know, um, uh, like formally specifying when, uh, like since essentially formally talk about, uh, talking about syntactic, syntactic properties um, like, um, for example, a variable, like a, a, a variable denoting uh, a predicate that actually doesn't depend on another variable, okay? And so uh, this expression here, like this is also a sort of quantifier, this uh, inverted uh, F, the Latich code is also backslash F inverted, or backslash F inv, um, means that the, uh, the expression here, you know, this predicate, is actually constant with respect to x. So x does not actually show up in this. And this can be formalized in, in this fashion. You know, um, If you already have an interpretation in mind for the universal quantifier, then you can think about it and, and note that this actually makes sense. Right? So you might think of the opposite, for example, just to justify why this works. If, um, if this, uh, this predicate would depend on x, like if they are, let's say, classically speaking, if they are like x for which the predicate is false and other x for which it is true, right? Then this would say that um, for for all x, uh, like for any given x, if you plug it into that, then this might you know be true or false. Uh, follows that that uh, the predicate is true for all x right which would be false and then the, the statement would be that there the, the statement as a whole would be false because then there you would have some x for which this is uh true while while this is false so true and false false this means the whole thing is is false and so um if this actually depends on x then this fails to to hold true and if it does not depend on x, if this is actually a constant, 
then this is a true statement and, and therefore this this expression here is equivalent to stating that uh, semantically um, to stating that the this symbol does not actually depend on x okay um, so you can use that and you can think about it a little bit if you want um, but just to remember the few times that this expression pops up you know this inverted f that just says that that this expression is constant um, with respect to this particular symbol x or if you like if you use argument brackets and you say this is a, a unary predicate then that would say this unary predicate is actually a constant it's either a true or false but doesn't actually depend on on uh, whatever you plug in okay uh and okay apart from these logical uh, standard model standard things um you have like things defined like the subset for example this is a standard definition of what it means for, for a set to be a subset but again I, you think of these uh, substitutions like these these expressions these abbreviations as just you take you take the left hand side and plug in the right hand side okay uh, i don't want to impose any semantics or any reading of any of these symbols now because the, the axioms of of, uh, of mathematics impl implicitly tell us what these axioms mean um, so this this definition is just saying if you see this somewhere then this just means somebody uh, didn't want to write uh, in a long statement and you just take this and translate it to that in the statement and then you go on working right? This is just a, like a syntactic replacement and there's no meaning in, involved. So when I say this is the subset relation, I don't already uh, like imply that, oh, it must be obvious that this is a subset relation. It all depends on what these symbols mean, but the whole axioms effectively then, then state what it means. And then only then we have an interpretation as subset. And, okay. Okay, and then some more, you know, standard things, the symbols for the empty set, the symbol for the arbitrary union power set and um, sets with the same cardinality. Um, but these will only show up at the very end of the video. Then uh, in my informal explanations, as I use lambda calculus, we are also going to talk about functions, whatever that means. I'm not going to, to formal formalize the tools that I use to motivate the axioms. The axioms are just what is, what is formal uh, in this video, and there's concatenation of functions and so on and so forth. Uh, and then um, how tight this this bound, right? There are also this simplification that you don't use a million uh, brackets everywhere. So, for example, if I write down this, then I would put this in bracket. That like this, this just means that you know it's not to be interpreted um, as close binding. Although uh, I will. I think in most of the axioms, I actually uh, did the job and put the brackets there to make it very clear what, what's going on. Similar for implications. Okay, negation binds uh, stronger, for example. These are still just conventions. Mm, okay. As I already said, we're not really going to use argument brackets, but we, we a priori think of all the predicates as potentially depending on a variable. Um, and the, the axioms then completely formalize how how to what we can actually do and everything's handled then through the axioms um and then uh here also like this for example like if if p happens to be a, defined as an expression uh that depends on y then this means like substituting all instances of y simultaneously with x and here i give an example Okay, um, and yeah, I've already said we're going, uh, we're going to stick very close to the IZF, uh, like the intuitionistic Zemilo Frankel metamorph setup, especially um, the up to the equalities, including the equalities. This is basically all you will find all the statements uh, somewhere on the metamorph uh, site, and then in the set theory part I go a little bit weaker than than uh, metamorph although in the end on top i put uh, excluded middle and choice and then you are back to standard uh similar frankel um and then uh a more technical note not going to get too much in detail here but this metamorph you know the, 
the name actually stands for um, did I write it down meta yeah meta math I think it stands meta variable um, mathematics or so um, and the the idea is there that that you have basically uh, st uh, these laws written down as schemes where they ha there are free parameters. So for example, if we go, I have closed the site now, but if you go on the web page and, and go to this, these statements, they are like on the page highlighted in red, these, par these parameters, which are basically free, like quote unquote free there. And you might think of them as being closed on the meta level. So they have this for all and this, sorry, this, for, this is just for the like, already technically well versed people to to uh, like understand the, the the calculus of this uh the source where i uh, have them uh, most of the axioms from um you have this basically two levels the 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 quantifier which bind variables in the object language uh and then these these expressions that you write down may also be have these three parameters and they are uh, like free one level higher basically you can i the way i will write it down it will be very explicitly to, to make the translation to the this web page axioms easier to make it easier for you to see how the axioms then are actually for example used um i will write down as i said here for all x and this means basically the for all on one level higher okay um but uh like if you're not uh like do an actual um, like this machine verification you might also think of all the axioms universally closed they will be like close enough in, in, it will in any case be uh, like the the semantics what 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 is intended to, with the statements is, is uh, should be clear and um if you have more questions then go to this the web page that i, I just linked you before and this long first page where they explain exactly their calculus um, okay. Okay. So we will start simple um, with propositional calculus, and now I will like the rest of the video will just go through the axioms and and explain and motivate all this. Okay. So. As I said, when I talked about the Hilbert style logics there there's this Hilbert cell and there's various other um, logic calculi and the this the standard Hilbert style uh, calculi are um, characterized by basically having as, as rule of inference rule of inference is this this uh, law that you use as the the player as the mathematician as the formalist to get to new statements right so what this says, yeah, and by the way, um, similar with the, with the, sorry, similar with the for all X, like similar with this free X, um, you could add this, like, uh, okay, let me sh show you what I mean. Uh, and we come down to the predicates, then sometimes I will have this for all, right? So this, there, there this, this is, this is like a quantifier on, on the, on the on the meta level on one level higher than the object language like the expressions the the statements that the expressions make like when, when you read the interpretation of uh, like some sentence in logic that would be the object language and then from the user uh, level like we as mathematicians we we are on the meta uh, level and that's where this, this what meta comes in right and so for this for all y's for any given y for example this is would be a talk on the meta level and then you have this statement and the statement makes some, some logical claim in the object language. And similar to, uh, like, I'm very explicit there with the variables, like this set variables, this, per, this uh, in MetaMath it would be called set var uh, variables. Um, you could also do that with this, um, what is there called, well-formed for, well formulas, which I will uh, just call predicates. Or propositions in the case of the propositional logic um so you got here read uh all statements be um you know but before every statement you could say for all uh well formulas uh, phi, uh, 
phi and psi, for example, holds, and then comes the statement. Okay, I will not oh, I will not add this for all predicates. When I read this statement, then you should think of this like being an axiom for all these predicates, of course. Okay, um, and I will give examples where these gener generic variables are instantiated in a second. So the rule modus ponens is, is the following: you have like you have the two things uh, over the line, and you ha you have some statement, some proposition, um, phi, and then you have another proposition which reads uh, phi implies psi in the object language, right? In here in the object language, that says something. Then also in the object language, it says that this claim implies some other claim. Okay, and once you have these two statements, then the rule of inference, what this is, this modus ponens as a rule, um, says that now this uh, psi as a standalone uh, claim in the object language is also um, given. Like it's also proven. Like if this is judged to be true and this is judged to be true, then this is also judged to be true. Okay. And in this way, we, we let's say we have a, uh, like let's say we start with three axioms, and they can be plugged together. Like they have this 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 sort of these schemes and these forms. There are some statements, and then there are some implications involving these statements. We have three of them, and we can use modus ponens uh, um, if if it works out to take two of them and say, oh, now we can also produce a third. And you can think of all statements you have already proven, including the axioms, which are like proven by assumption, so to speak. Um, and and you, you generate more. With the rules of inference, you generate more statements. So suddenly you have study you three, then you have four. And then you have a f with this fourth, maybe you can combine it with the rules of inference somehow else. And then you get a fifth one. And so you gradually raise the number of statements that are proven true and uh, this is the this is one of two rules the other rule is also like uh, like even simpler in a way we will see it then later um, but this is the main rule to generate new statements like you have true two different um, propositions like this is any proposition this is some other and if they if they are syntactically fit the scheme then you can get another one this is which will generally be different from the ones you had before. Okay, so uh, here is what here it says what I um, just said. So this is an inference rule. Uh, this involves here's a statement in the object language, here's a statement in the object language, and then you get another st uh, statement in the object language. Uh, if this uh, symbol this is the uh, conjunction uh, denotes end, then this uh, modus ponens in the object language would be expressed like this. So phi and uh, phi implies psi implies psi, right? This is the same idea, like the same the same logical like notion, but here as a rule of inference to produce more statements and here is this is a closed thing in the object language, right? So, um, So uh, this statement, for example, you know, this is this is an, a statement in the object language, and it could be um, plugged in, like a, a here a, as as this this uh, uh, propositional variable, right? So this is any statement. This is a well-formed formula, and this is a also a well like it's a scheme of well-formed form like for any well-formed formula for any two well-formed formula phi and psi. This is a new well-formed formula. And uh, you can plug this also like this this as a like as a statement depending on variables as a propositional variables also in here or in this case it even fi fits this scheme where this um, symbol would be replaced by this okay you, I mean uh, if this is confusing at the moment then I did a bad job but you will maybe see in the examples that come how this all plays out. But uh, I mean, I, I guess if you watch this video, you you sort of understand how substitution works, and that you you can like clarify the way in which you use the variables. And uh, that if if a statement is, is three x and another statement is five x plus seven, then you can see how you can plug in the second one into the first in the first x, and you get three times 
5x plus 7, right? And hopefully you don't get confused that there were some two instances of x involved, okay? Um, okay, so in any case, um, don't want to talk myself in the corner here. Here as an example with particular interpretations of this well-formed formula variables, right? So I instantiate now this two. Um, and then I can, um, for example, get this statement that's according to this axiom, to this like um, this rule, let's say, and, or this law here, uh, a valid statement to make. If it rains, um, yeah, if it rains and if, uh, is, is this English grammar? I'm not sure. If it rains and if that, it is raining implies, and if the fact that it's raining implies that I'm wet, then I'm wet. Okay. If it is raining outside, which coincidentally it just started to rain, uh, um, and if it's raining implies that I'm wet, for example, because I, I stand on the street, then um, so if it, on the one hand it's raining and on the one hand it's raining implies I'm wet, then this also implies I'm wet. So this is the idea that is conveyed with with the statement, right? Okay, this is very basic, but uh, like maybe it helps that I'm a little bit more explicit when we come to these more con uh, maybe more difficult statements. Okay, and I want to also emphasize because this will be the reading that we have uh, with the lambda calculus. Um, here in this uh, reading, I took all the statements at face value, but um, the, in, instead of just saying, making the statement, for example, it rains, there's another statement that I can make, namely, I have a reason to believe that it rains. Yeah? For example, a friend told me, or I, I see some evidence for it, uh, if you look out, out the window, and I have a reason to believe, uh, is added here. And this is the reading that is the, lurks behind the, the constructive readings as well. And when we talk about the uh, lambda calculus interpretation, for example, or the Curry Howard interpretation, then um, it's very helpful to keep in mind that these statements are read as like, a statement is proven once you have an argument for it, right? Um, to say, um, to make the claim uh, that it's, it's rains might be taken to mean that you have actually a good argument that it's actually raining or you have a reason to believe that it's raining. So this just makes the sentence longer, but this is the sort of reading that we're going to use when we, when I talk about these statements often, because these, these uh, like substantial, that you have a witness, that you have an argument, claims uh, have this constructive uh, computation in, in the, uh, interpretation as well, uh, like an implementation as well. So the statement that I just said here, uh, I may also translate it to to this here that I say, if I have a reason to believe that it rains and if I have the reason to believe that uh, me having a reason to believe that it is raining implies that I have a reason to believe that I'm wet, then I have a reason to believe that I'm wet, is the statement that Modus Polnus is saying. And, and here, like for I have a reason to believe or me having a reason to believe, I write the same sentence again and just write R for reason to believe, okay? Um, and so just up front, I will also now discuss already like the, these readings of the law of excluded middle, for example, right? So I think I did a video on non-classical logics at one point. I'm not sure if it's still uh, on YouTube. Um, but consider this, like uh, you are hit over the head and um, you wake up in a hospital um, and you see, oh, you have some scars there, some weeks have passed, you don't know really where you are, but you're in a hospital room, <laughs> I'm thinking of this tragic story here, and this hospital room has no windows, okay, you don't know whether it's uh, day or night, you know, you, you don't know if you, like, if you could w look out of the window whether it would be light because it's day, or it would, it would be dark because it's night, and now you can say, well, um, like, the a naive claim to make, like a standard claim to make, is um, either it's light outside, you know, either there's sunlight outside, or uh, it's not the case that there's sunlight outside. Okay, this is a, a like a, a st statement most people would agree with, and I want to emphasize that this is a different statement than this 
uh, what you get uh, like s semantically is a different statement than what you get if you add this i have two reasons to believe there right because you just woke up in this room you don't know anything of course you know either it's light outside or it's not light outside but consider the following statement i have a reason to believe that it's light outside or i don't have a reason to be uh, 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 re okay I don't have a reason to believe that it's light aside or I don't have a reason to believe that it's light aside. In this case, the second one will be, be true, right? You don't have a reason to believe that it's light aside. And th this is one statement. Uh, one, one, like, one application of this R modality. And then, uh, thirdly, you could also say, um, I have a reason, like, I have a reason to believe that it's light outside. Or I have a reason to believe that it's not light outside, right? Now I have the, the negation is closer to the uh, to the proposition than in the statement before, right? And this this claim now is constructively not tr true, and on and, and and it's also like semantically in this you know made up example not not true because you w woke up you you don't know anything there's no windows and you you you, you neither have a reason to believe that it's light outside nor do you have a reason to believe that it's not light outside right if the if the negation is closer to the proposition then you get suddenly a statement which uh, is is a disjunction is like an or statement but if there if there is reason to believe like if there's this cons this witness um in in front of both this left and right side then uh, suddenly it's not true anymore because it, it depends on this the sub subjective knowledge of this agent, right? It's, it depends on this um, on uh, what the, this person knows, and the person might not have a, re have a reason to believe either the positive statement and the negation of this positive statement. And this is sort of the 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 way you can sometimes think of statements find quickly out if they are constructively provable because the statement is constructively provable if you have an actual argument for a thing and uh, if you just lack knowledge then you might also lack an argument and then it's not as binary as you know saying oh it's always either night or day but if you if it, it's about what you actually have in your hand the constructive fitness then it might not be so clear okay uh, and also there's this fourth way where you have you, you can say then um, I have uh, like you, you just do this one this one R in front right you say I I have a reason to believe that it's either um, light outside or not light outside and then that would again be true again assuming you believe uh, that's always either night or day okay so this was just a tangent um, to to see this this reason this reading that we are going to use when we go to the lambda calculus which which explicitly treats the reason to believe it ex explicitly treats what is called the witness um okay so let's go to the first real law so by law i mean the statement in the, the this axiom in this case in the object language right so this is uh, simp um i just like the word that's why i left it there it stands for simplification um, but really it's a sort of weakening okay the statement is for you know for all uh welfare formulas phi and psi it holds that if phi uh like phi implies that psi implies phi right so and here is like a nat natural language sentence if i have a reason to believe that it rains then and then some some other psi then if i have a reason to believe that i drank coffee today well then I still have a reason to believe it rains, right? This whether or not I drank coffee today is pretty irrelevant to what I read. And th the same is true in, in general. If I have a reason to believe the first statement, right, then I already have a reason to believe the first statement. Then uh, if I have a reason to believe some other statement, it doesn't affect uh, the, the fact that I, I have this reason, you know? However, the, in, in the fear, I've already declared that I have a reason to believe that. So whatever comes uh, implies that I still have, like I still have this reason that I had from the start, right? It doesn't like, um, like it doesn't add to it and it also doesn't take to it. And this is the axiom that we are going to adopt here. And um, so what this corresponds to is 
then um, also like in this in you know in the, in the um, Curry Howard interpretation, you have the this relationship between well-formed formulas and uh, propositions here and types, and then if the propositions are types, then the implications become function spaces and the, the conjunctions become pairs. Um, and then um, we can also have this like functional implementation of why this like in, in, in details, at least for this function, namely, if uh, I have a, a variable of some value, like you consider this some, some um, collection of uh, of values if i have a one element of this collection then if i have some other element of some other collection well then i still have an element of this collection right it doesn't affect it so the, there is this sort of um interpretation where you consider functions between types in parallel like in corresponding to this uh implications between propositions and so we see how we realize at least in this function case this statement um, namely by having a function like given any value we have here a function which um, di like doesn't do anything with this new value and just returns the old value that was already given to to it a step earlier this is a whatever uh, we get here this thing will be a constant function with the, that always returns the value that we already have um, and here i've written down then like various like implementations or ways to write down this this concept right if i have a reason to believe um, phi then if i have a reason to believe psi I still have a reason to believe phi here i this is the same statement i just do a subscript with the proposition that um, P is the, the proof of, the reason to believe it, the witness, uh, this is the same statement. And then uh, like I write this down, just introduce now the lambda calculus, which uses uh, not functions, like not, not this maps to symbol, but does lambda and then this object and then point. But this is like just uh, like a syntactic translation. This means the same thing as this thing, or this means the same thing as this thing. Basically, roughly speaking, the lambda literally just means this maps to. And then here also extra uh, with this type notation. But again, you know, um, if I have a reason p to believe phi, and if I, uh, then if I have a reason to believe a reason q to believe psi, I still have the reason. Uh, I still have the reason to believe phi named p. <laughs> okay, and then you would like the, the constructive proof of this. Theorem interpreted as type would be this lambda term. Okay, I hope this is more or less clear. In here in Python, this function looks like so. Like in this way, proofs become function. That's the whole like the, the magic of the curry out interpretation. Okay, um, so moving on. Like I will not spend so much time on all the axioms, but it's good if you're up to a slow start. Frege. This is also like. Like as soon as you have this constructive interpretation in mind, the, the reason to believe interpretation, then all the statements that are constructively true are tri like almost trivial. Like you can see them very quickly usually, um, at least like in the propositional calculus where there are just so few elements um, to deal with. Here I came up with an interpretation, um, one that validates that. If me being Justin Bieber, um, if me being a Justin Bieber fanboy implies that if I'm on a Justin Bieber concert, then I hyperventilate. So here, this is me being a fanboy. If this implies that me being on a concert implies I hyperventilate, then if me being a Justin Bieber fanboy implies that I will be um, on the Justin Bieber concert, you know, this was, I'm the fanboy, this was the concert. Well, if this is both the case, then if I'm actually a Justin Bieber fanboy, then this implies that I will hyperventilate, right? If uh, like this this whole con uh, like con going to the concert thing is also like on the table, then uh, just being a Justin Bieber fanboy because I will be on a concert will mean already means that I hyperventilate. This going to the concert has like been absorbed, and I suppose this makes sense, right? This is just what what this says, and 
Uh, I w also want to emph emphasize here that I, um, I, in, in my examples, in my readings, I take statements that are assumed to be true, right? Uh, but uh, since this is like this, uh, this logic calculus, we also might uh, make uh, like statements that are false. For example, if, um, like you could plug in here, if my name is Nikolai, then if my name is um, Tom, then I will eat spaghetti tomorrow. Uh, like if my name is Nikolai implies that if my name is uh, Tom, then I will eat spaghetti tomorrow, then if my name is Nikolai implies that my name is Tom, then my, then my name being Nikolai implies I will spaghetti, eat spaghetti tomorrow. It doesn't actually, like the, the truth of the statements, um, at, at, at the very least in the binary uh, classical logic interpretation will not depend, like there, it will be a tautology. It will not depend actually on whether the statements are true. The, the, the logical um, interpretation um, as axioms will for, for sure be true because they're axioms, they're true by definition, but everything I derive from them, everything I derive from the axioms, even if they're nonsensical statements in, like the ones I read, uh, will from the logical structure still make sense nevertheless, right? The, 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 the truth of the statements that are provable does not depend on the truth of the ingredients as the propositions that I, I plug into these general abstract logic statements. Okay, this is just a, also a note on the side and is especially clear once you get, go to some semantic, maybe algebraic given interpretation or Boolean interpretation. Um, that I will not discuss in this video, but then it's even even easier to see um, uh, that things play out. So uh, all, I'm, all I'm saying is that uh, these statements don't have to make sense to consider them theorems, assume from, uh, uh, proven from from axioms, where axioms are just statements true by assumption. Okay, and I could also translate the statement, of course, to one with. I have a reason to believe, like I can plug this in everywhere and I would have to plug it in for every implication and before every statement, then I would have like 10 or so, probably more, probably one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, yeah, like 13 reason to believe. I could like put them into the sentence to make it, to make it to this harder to validate constructive claim, but I will not do that just because I'm not crazy. <laughs> Okay, and uh, the proof of this statement in like in this function reading is very similar, like it's easy as well. Um, so if like you have always to check with the type, like what like my, my claim is uh, this is the proof of the statement as in the function reading. So it says let, let's let's first check whether or not this is a sensible function, right? Okay, here we have a function that maps an f to a function that maps a g to a function that maps a p to this expression. Um, and so this claims here is like f of p is concatenated. So f must be a function that takes a p. So this first f must be a function which takes something of the type of p. And the return value must be a function that be, can be concatenated with g. And the return value of this concatenation, it, it takes a p. So this g is also something that takes a p. Well, okay. So uh, why this works out, um, we can see here. So, um, the uh, phi, right, will be justified with p. p will be a proof of, of, of this thing. g will be uh, this, this implication here, which indeed takes um, a proof of phi. This is why, this is why um, g actually takes a, a p here, but this works out. And the first f will will is this thing like it's, it's a proof for this statement interpreted as a type, um, and indeed the argument for them this is again a, a phi so this is why f can take a phi it returns this thing which can be concatenated with this thing because this uh, and proof of this thing is like like the g ends in a psi and the psi is ex exactly the, the input for psi so you can see that it works out here let me let me read this proof in in words okay I have to do it on the fly now but it should be doable so uh, the proof for this statement is the following if i have a reason to believe 
if I re let's let me actually read the, the names of these letters as well. If I have a reason, uh, call it F, to believe that phi implies that psi implies uh, key. I'm not sure if this is the English pronunciation, but <laughs> let's say key. Uh, then, if I have a reason to believe that uh, phi implies psi, if I have a reason G to believe that phi implies chi, uh, phi, uh, phi implies key. Uh, then, if I have a reason to be p to believe uh, phi, then the, then uh, as we will see, I have a reason to believe he. And what is the reason he? For what is the reason to believe he? Well, uh, we will eventually obtain it uh, here from uh, from this from this uh, as a return value um, of the function that is the return value of f, right? F was the argument for that, for F to be true, uh, like for F was the argument for 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 this thing, and uh, F was an implication. So F gives us another um, another uh, uh, gives us a return value that is a reason to believe this Im uh, implication, right? Uh, indeed, we get this implication because uh, by assumption we have a reason to believe phi. Okay, so f together with the reason to believe uh, phi, like the reason to believe this together with the reason to believe this gives us a reason to believe this, right? And if we have a reason to believe that phi implies he, and we have a reason to believe a reason g to believe that um, phi implies phi, then we have a reason to believe that phi implies he. Okay. Hope that makes sense. Like uh, maybe maybe we can actually do it with with uh, with this here. So uh, if I have a reason to believe that me being a Justin fanboy implies <laughs> that uh, if I'm a Justin fanboy, I will hyperventilate. Uh, and if I have uh, a reason to believe that me being a Justin fanboy implies I will be on a Justin fanboy concert, then uh, me being a Justin Bieber fanboy implies that I'll hi hyperventilate because um, because if indeed I'm a Justin fanboy, then indeed being on a con Justin Bieber concert will mean I'll hyperventilate and I will be on a, a Justin Bieber concert because that was the second condition that I had. That was exactly the second condition that I assumed. Okay, so maybe maybe you think about it yourself. I hope it kind of makes sense. Um, but everything like works together. Once you translate the, the proposition to the um, this type, then at least in this interpretation, it's very clear. And otherwise, you might also maybe you even think that it's that it's clear. It's a long statement. It's like a, a long-winded ex expression, but it makes sense. This this chain of impl implication it makes sense, and this is was just ex um, explained here with this constructive interpretation. Okay, then these lambdas. This is as I just said. This before. This is just another notation for these implications. Um, here is another statement that is also in this in this interpretation uh, obviously true, and I say it's obviously true. You can also then formally de derive it from statements like modus ponens, the rule, and, and this rule, this law, and this law. You can now use this and these expressions and try to find the right expressions. Plug it into modus ponens, and then the, the things will come out. Something that will come out um, if you play around with this long enough is this statement here. If phi implies psi, then if um, psi implies he, then phi implies he. I mean, uh, might make sense to you. Here's the proof in the reading uh, that you might now be able to read. Um, and then I give uh, for contrast the statement which is not actually uh, provable. So the statement uh, phi implies psi implies psi. This is not constructively provable because, I, like, if you think about it, I cannot derive a reason to believe this thing if I just have an implication that something for which I don't have a reason to believe it uh, implies that. 
And if you still uh, look at it a little bit longer, then you quickly, by the way, see that this very much relates to to modus ponens here. Like basically, if I'm lacking a reason to believe phi, then from just this, I cannot uh, conclude this. Um, okay. So um, now the the end introduction. Now we we are. This, these these laws are usually split into um, introduction and elimination rules for these syntactic expressions. Here's the introduction. Uh, if I have a reason to believe phi and I have a reason to believe psi, then I have two reasons, right? I have a reason to believe phi and a reason to believe psi. And syntactically, I write it down as phi and psi. Okay, simple enough. Um, in in the constructive calculus, I introduce these pairs. Like you can think of them. No, let's actually not go there. Um, I introduced them here as, as just as, as syntactic rules. Um, and that would be the proof for this statement in this interpretation. Or, you know, I, 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 here I say I prove the statement, but the, the proof is in, the, in this particular constructive interpretation. Here, as I just go through these axioms, I can also just take them as axioms. As just say, this syntactically expression is true for all this. Uh, well-formed formulas. I just take it at face value. This is an axiom. I just motivate it here with this constructive reasoning. Um, and here, uh, the end elimination. If I have a reason to believe this and a reason to believe that, then I have in particular a reason to believe this, right? Like I can just throw away this statement. Or no, if uh, today I ate sushi and I um, watched a movie, then today I ate sushi, right? I, if I have two things which are true, then in particular, the first one is true. Okay. Here, modus ponem, here's a, here where the, would be the constructive justification for modus ponem. Just as we had the left elimination, have the right elimina elimination, right? If I today ate sushi and I ate a movie, then I also uh, if I sorry, if today I ate sushi and watched a movie, then I also today watched the movie. Um, yeah, here I give another example. Well, here I repeat myself apparently. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> um, and now disjunction. Um, the statement is if at least one of them is true, if either one, uh, either phi is true or psi is true, and if, okay, let me start the sentence again. If either um, phi being true or psi being true implies uh, xi, then phi implies xi and, uh, and, uh, xi, um, and psi implies xi. And um, this works because, okay, let's assume indeed one of them is true and they imply that, right? So this is, this is related to explosion. Maybe I should, uh, should introduce this or later, but there's this, pr this principle of uh, like, these are very easy to, to justify with um with um how do, how do i say that without being like and i can now go from like start with the constructive approach to justify it or with the explosion approach where you say from a false statement follows everything which is in particular easy to justify in arithmetic where if you prove something that's false like zero is one then you can prove anything from that because you know, or then three times one equals three times zero. So suddenly you have three is zero and, and you can do that with any number and suddenly from zero is one, you can prove anything. And um, so in particular, then we will also have that if you have a false statement, then this also implies anything. And um, Therefore, like with this explosive reading, <laughs> explosive reading, um, 
uh, you also have this like this uh, this statement if basically uh, you, you cannot check if the like if you have uh, like a reason to believe uh, phi and uh, the assumption here a reason to believe that this this junction implies um, xi then um, then okay then then you have this implication if uh, like uh, uh, like classically you don't have like you have a reason to believe that that psi would be false right then then it implies psi as well right if psi is false like if it's false on its own then it implies this um, in any case if so if both of them are false then both of them imply them these separately. If one of them is uh, is uh, true, and the other false, then um, you, and you have this implication, then uh, then the conjunct like in the in the semantic interpretation, this would be easier to explain maybe with uh, two functions, right? The semantic impl in the, uh, in, uh, interpretation, but. Uh, if if this is false and the, uh, and this like if this is true and this is false, then the the this junction together is uh, also just true because true and false is true in this in this semantic reading like in this Boolean algebra reading, and then um, you have this this statement that just the left hand side implies the right hand side, and. Here, like I'm justifying that I'm not the biggest fan of, as you might notice here, I'm not the biggest fan actually of, of uh, explosion for uh, reasons that I will discuss when we actually introduce also the explosive law, um, as we will do in a second here. Um, in any case, uh, let's now move on from that and for the, the uh, constructive reading. So, uh, by the way, this goes in, in both directions, but but the, the other direction is more or less trivial, right? If both of these imply uh, the left hand side then if the, then you, you can take either of them and they will imply this so if if uh, this is an, an or and this is an end then if you start here it's easy to get here the other direction is a little bit more harder to justify especially um, like if you want to reason with explosion because it's a little bit harder to implement than for example implications and end um, but um, let's just go to, the, to this constructive reading in terms of lambda terms. Okay, this is a little bit longer, so I, I hope by now you you have that you're able to to read that. But so um, so here, um, ba -ba -ba, let, let's start with this direction that we like discussed the, the longest time now. If um, if a reason to believe this here is called F, um, and and here we consider the implication from the left hand side to the right hand side, right? This direction, um, then then um, the the proof of that or the reason to believe that is a pair because this is an end, and we have said the interpretation of this end is. Uh, ju just a pair and, and both of them are again uh, functions or lambda terms um, and we are going to call the um, the re reason to believe the expression on the left hand side uh, by p and how do we then justify this well we already have this um, this this function which maps either like this fun function f which maps either of these arguments to C, which we want here. So we can just take the, the argument on the left hand side that would be an argument for this here, here, and we conclude this and we get this. Okay, and the same um, spiel happens on this, this side because this function f takes either of the arguments in this function reading, right? This is like like a, a, a joint, like a, a, the union of these types, if you will. It, this function here takes either of these and returns that, and so you you got you got this here. Um, and again, like here, this if I speak of a reason to believe, then I'm always like arguing in this positive way. 
and it is a little bit harder if the statements is like uh, like has this boolean true or false because then you have to also deal with the, the false case and then make the justification with what happens with these implications if uh, the, the the left hand side of an implication is false and then comes explosion comes into play but okay um and the other hand i mean the other hand is really so like very simple you have both of these ways to get to uh, to xi and so whatever you get here well if you get uh if you get uh, the left hand side you know here they ha you have this if statement this is how this if enters in this constructive interpretation like you you, you do basically a type checking what was the thing that you got um um a reason to believe phi or was there a reason to be believe psi and in in in, uh, in the first case you take the left hand side this f and in the other case you take the right hand side g and so this is the constructive like positive reason to believe interpretation um yeah okay here so you make this comment about the the, the explosion uh, with, um yeah for non for more non constructive reading of but yeah, I, mean, I read non constructive but i mean uh the the the, the, the case where yeah okay that's not that works Works, works out with what I said before. It's basically what I, what I just was said. When when you don't have like this positive reading of these propositions, where you also have to consider what actually what actually does this expression mean if the ingredients involved are uh, false. Um, okay, and. Yeah, uh, by the way, um, so the in, in this direction, um, like if you compare with other sources and in particular the, the book on constructive set theory, for example, that also has a, a like by um, Ascel that, uh, or on, in Ratien, I think, that also starts out with a short like overview of the logic that they are using. Most of the axioms are always the same, like the, the things I listed before uh, here. But rarely uh, do people use this by implication um, statement as an axiom. And instead, uh, in particular, there's oh, like uh, these these weakening statements. I call them here weakening, where uh, this rule where if you have uh, like an let's say you have already a true statement, if you already have a reason to believe uh, this, then you have, of course, a, a reason to believe this expression because, like, the one hand that you, the, the left hand, is already given, and then you cannot join whatever, uh, like. Or let 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 me like give you like um, the, an example reading. If it's raining, then it's also raining. Or my name is Nikolai, right? The the statement is true because we already like the the stack the. The implication is, is is given because the the assumption in the implication was something true and the the, the what comes out is just something which is strictly weaker than what we had before right if i have a gray t-shirt on then i have a gray t-shirt on or i'm tired right um the second statement is weaker because it's e easy to fulfill in particular because i have already established the first statement um Okay, uh, da, da, da. yeah, okay, here, um, you can now, like, I, I didn't even now write down what the lambda term here is, but given this, this if reading, you can try to prove this lambda calculus way. Okay, um, then uh, I think there's only two more to go. Here we have this not introduction. Um, phi implies if phi implies not phi, right? If like something like this is very like contradictory, like a statement implies its negation, then um, the uh, the negation holds, right? Like um, you can think of the negation of a statement as the statement uh, implying an absurdity, and then the reasoning maybe becomes true. If a statement implies that the statement implies an um, and uh, like absurdity, if you have a reason to believe something, and you have a reason to believe that that uh, something uh, implies an absurdity, then you have established that the 
that a reason having a reason to believe that thing implies an absurdity um in the constructive reading this is simple to prove because a, a generalization actually holds like with this um absurdity reading namely uh, th this statement here is easy to prove like if something implies that it implies something else um then it implies something else the here's here's the the argument if you have a, a reason to believe this then if you have a reason to believe this well then have you everything that you want to plug in here and here and you're already there right this makes sense so um this is how we introduce then the negation by saying we interpret the negation of a statement as saying that the the statement implies this bot symbol this absurdity and then uh if you plot pl uh, plot in bot for for uh, psi then you, you just get this this axiom this is the constructive justification but also here like if you have this sort of uh contradictory situation then this uh statement cannot be true because you know it leads to its own contradiction this is what this is saying uh, and then finally we have the, the the explosion or not elimination that um um i already mentioned if we have established that uh, phi leads to an absurdity then if we find out phi then we have a like a bad situation that uh, we ha we have we found a abs absurdity and then explosion means if you have found abs absurdity then everything becomes true again this is easy to justify in arithmetic otherwise it's a sort of like an axiom that is usually adopted to make a point that uh, if your uh, system has a contradiction then um you know shit hit the fan and everything follows um you can also like uh like there's this notion of currying and uncurring. Um, you can also read this as if a statement is both false and true, then everything goes. If this, uh, by the way, if this axiom doesn't hold, then you have what's called minimal logic. Like if you just use everything that all the axioms above, um, then you have this minimal logic where you don't actually have explosion. But uh, explosion is uh, helpful and has has sensible implication. And in, in particular, the um, in particular the disjunctive uh, syllogism, namely, um, da, da, da. here. Okay, so um, oh, no, wait a minute. Yeah, okay, here I discussed this. So uh, this is this is one version of writing, like the the uncurried version of this the disjunctive syllogism. If you have proven that either phi holds or psi holds, like either of those holds, and if you have proven that one of them um, does uh, not hold, then since you have already proven that either of these holds and one of them is false, then the other one one must be false. This is like the the common language. Um, reading here of this disjunctive syllogism so in, in formal terms that would be phi or psi implies that not uh, phi implies psi right so if um okay here's an example uh, my name my boss's name is um brad or my boss's name is tim and also uh, let me tell you my boss's name is not brad well, if you believe these two statements, then you know my boss's name is Tim, right? This is what happens here. And uh, to actually like, um, uh, to to prove this uh, with the the um, tools, with the interpretation we already developed in the, the rest of the video so far, you need actually the explosion because um, like if you have this if reading here, as we have introduced it here, then yeah, okay either um you are given psi and then anything of course implies psi that works um or you have um or you are given this um phi and also not phi and to for this to hold that must imply that this contradictory statement implies this new statement even if it doesn't have anything to do with it that that's just explosion okay this is how this relates to something which 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 makes sense 
I would say. This is my getting at it anyhow. Okay, so we, we are through with the propositional uh, statements as presented here. This is like intuitionistic statements. The last one would be law of excluded middle. I come to it back at the end, but it's like very simple. Anyhow, uh, we don't need it for, for math really, or, or at least uh, if we don't want to take shortcuts. Um, so one, two, two more notes though. Um, here's, here are two free RAMs. You can use the, the calculus, like the lambda calculus to find out why they, are, why they hold. If phi or psi hold, then if phi implies psi, then psi holds. This is very, like re really simple with this if interpretation. Like if I have either this or this, well, in case I have this, then I'm already uh, there. This is implied by anything. If I have this and also get this, then this is also true by modus ponem. Um, and otherwise, if I have both, then I can also do a lot and I can derive uh, from this implication, this, this statement, right? Because I can plug them in here, so to speak. Okay, so these are two implications. They are like obvious. Um, and so these, like if you have, if the other axioms uh, allow it, if, you are, if they are like, for example, classical enough, then you can actually also take these statements as, as a by implication. You can define actually the conjunction as so and the, the disjunction so and the conjunction like so. And this is done in some calculi. Um, some, if you have also universal quantifications so for various types, and you can actually do it like the calculus of constructions, which I showed you at the beginning of this video shortly, where they define various logic symbols, uh, just in terms of implications and universal quantifiers. Mm, okay. Okay, so <laughs> one and a half hours in, I will miss my meeting, but so be it. Um, here we now go to the um, propositional calculus and this like if I want to bring you this the constructive justifications uh, here as well uh, although the you should be able to understand the, the claims the axioms made um, what, the, what they are intent to say also also straightforwardly but um, here we are dealing with now uh, variables as I said before they will be sets but these are just uh, variables which uh, a priori just range over this domain of this course and uh, the, in, in the handling that we're going to use uh, this is going to look very similar to how we handle the proof terms with this lambda calculi right so when i talk about like for all which is what the predicate logic part here is all about then this is also again very similar to these like functions where you say something must work for all x and then you can write lambda x for that um, so uh, here recall the first um, th the simplification rule that I explicitly wrote down with the types in the lambda calculus um, the, you can think of the, argu the arguments, the reason to believe these predicate calculus statements also justified with similar terms, except um, we are going to deal with this x, y, z, this, this uh, set variables or t like abstractly term, like this term variables. And we might also think them of them as a type, like the universe of this course. Uh, I will denote this, at least in this sentence here, just as v, for von Neumann universe, which happens to be then this, this concept of this class of all sets. And then we have all, we can also, we may re read any given particular set as being of this type of set. Okay, but this is, again, this is not necessary to, to read these axioms. This is just a one way of, of thinking about them uh, in a way that's readily implementable. So if you have some uh, given predicate P uh, that possibly might depend on this uh, variable or parameter x. Here I'll give you an example. This is a statement, it's not the case that x is an x. So this is like a scheme, right? It's a, a scheme of many, uh, I, I, I read some particular predicate p, but this is like varying with this parameter x. For any given x, you have the claim that it's not the case that x contains itself. This is going to be the reading of the statement here. Um, and uh, so if P dep may depend on X, may or not be 
depend on x then we can uh, get a new property so y is missing um, for all x holds the p this is another claim so in this case with this example that i just gave that would be the claim for all sets hold that it's not the case that the set is an element of itself that happens to actually also to be a provable uh, statement in most set theories and then um, so if we have a proof for that for every x and you know, for every like for every instance of the parameter we have a proof uh, p and they fit into this one expression which might also depend of, of x so for if for every x there's an expression depending on an x uh, that is a, can be read as a proof of this statement for all xp um, then we might also write this down analogous to this here except now we're dealing with the quantifiers over sets you know, for all sets you know, for all x in the universe of this course which are sets which are the von Neumann universe in most set theories um, then uh, for, for all of these, I have concrete proof that um, P over this, this is actually, yeah, that uh, that P holds. And so this is the, the typing statement. So do you see that this is justified again with a function and where P of a particular X proves uh, the corresponding uh, capital P of a particular X. Okay, so uh, this again, this whole block, I spent three to five minutes on it, but this is like for you to, to uh, quickly understand how a transition, for example, to a uh, proof relevant type theory would look like. And is there also a good way to, how to, to think about these constructive proofs and, and how I think it's worth pointing out. So uh, most of these, um, these rules these laws that i'm going to introduce they are like from a semantic point of view very like sort of trivial okay so hopefully we'll get through them a little bit quicker um but uh, even if they are simple i'm of course not leaving them out i will discuss them so we start out with the rule of generalization if and and here uh you know i should write you know, for all possible parameters uh like in the in the meta math reading for is this this is to be understood as um, for all possible parameters that this predicate might depend on um, it's the case that if this uh, holds then it especially holds if I like put this quantifier um, like over it that doesn't change the like the truth value of it anymore anyhow right so um, okay let's all living humans have a uh, Ahead, right so for for any living human it's the case that um, uh, he has a head or he or she has a head or they have a head um, and so I can make this statement you know anyone who has a head and can add this extra quantifier over it I can, I can generalize you know for all um, whatever uh, is in, in my domain of the course for all like let's stick with, with humans for, for all humans it's the case that any human has a head and th th this is like i mean i make it uh, so to speak weaker maybe that's not the best uh, like, explanation of the, the statement but it's like so the a, a formal you can add this uh, dependency that's actually not there this is similar as i say here to to the simp right where we had if something is already true, then something else being true uh, doesn't affect that this was already true, right? And here we have this extra dependency, and as I just discussed, this for all is like like, like an, another lambda term quantifier uh, to be added to be, be provable. If something is uh, provable without dependency, then in particular I can close any like existing and non-existing dependencies there. Okay. Uh, so this is like a little bit of a formal uh, thing that if you do proof in a book then you will probably not even think about this and it's so so, so clear but if you want to formalize things and check them you might need this these rules um, and also note this is an inference rule here formally it is an inference rule to add statements that are to, to generate new statements which are universally closed in this sense um, 
Okay, so if, um, oh, this is also it's like, again simple here. If um, for all parameters, uh, like for all parameters that we are, would have otherwise here, um, if the um, phi, the statement phi does not depend on, on x, if this is, if phi is constant with respect to, to x or with respect to whatever, uh, you know, parameter um, we highlight for this predicate, um, if this not, does not actually depend on it, then if it holds, then it already holds for everything and we can add this, this quantifier. This is basically the version of this, right? This is related to this generalization. If the, uh, there's no dependence, if we have this just given, then um, we can conclude this more close thing. Okay. I hope these are not like they are, they are like so simple that they, they might be confusing that they are even there. But you need them for like actually adding this universal quantifiers there. This is similar. These both are similar except here. Um, here this is split in you have this and then you get this uh, what i did not do by the way in this video is doing these turn styles there which say um, if this is provable then this is provable or if this is proven then this is proven i sort of implicated that in my uh, in my language and that as i said that we take this loss as axioms we say that they are proven by assumption you could also add an, um, everywhere this this turn styles Okay, and then if you you know if you know the universal quantifier, then you know these rules already, right? If uh, x is is bound, like this statement, this, here is the axiom that says that x that formalizes. We we have to formalize it here in this in this very formal uh, discussion. X is bound in this statement. So this statement where you bind uh, all free x um, with this universal quantifier says that this thing does not depend on x anymore because um, all of them are bound, right? So if I say, if I have the predicate, um, you know, uh, walks on four feet, and then I say, for all dogs, it is the case that they walk on four feet, then uh, the statement, for all dogs, is the case that uh, they walk uh, on four feet, does not have a, a, like a free slot for dog anymore, because I already said for all dogs, it's the case. So there's nothing, no... I cannot take, take uh, like the dog of my neighbor and plug it in anywhere because the statement is already like, closed. Again, this is super trivial. Um, but it's like, this formalization here. And then similarly, like the permutation of quantifiers. If, if you have the, have the statement that, um, you know, um, I don't know, uh, if you say, um, animal loves <laughs> and then can I say uh, I don't know for, for all dogs it's the case that they love all food something like that or all yeah for, for all food I mean for every meal they do love it or something like that okay I mean if you work with them then um, you, you know that it doesn't really matter there um, how, how way you which way you go about it also, especially once you already have the set theoretical universe, then you can also actually formalize in, uh, that in a way that you say you quantify, you do take a universal quantifier over pairs, and then you can project out this left or right component in that sense. Um, and then it's even more evident because nothing holds you from projecting out in this or that order. <clears throat> okay. Uh, axiom of like this is also like maybe in natural deduction calculus it would be more obvious obvious what happens here how you work with that but if you have a statement and it holds true for all uh, elements in the domain of the scores i.e. if it holds for all sets then you can take any set you can you, you whatever um, whatever set you take on the meta level you make a choice I take this particular set and then um, you consider the predicate with this set and then it holds for this particular set because you have already proven that it holds for all sets, right? So this is an implication. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is uh, like uh, this sort of boring formal rule where you, you as you see here, you have statements with quantifiers and you you, you pull this out. 
and yeah this is also like I, I make a note here how this relates to various things like you you can do uh, now you can look at it from this this functional perspective and see you know if uh, I have an argument here that um, an argument for this gives me uh, like an argument that this is true for all gives me that uh, this is true for all then in, the, in this functional reading this means that you have a function that maps a function uh, here to a function here. Recall that this for all have this functional interpretation. And then when, once you have these functions, then um, it's not hard then to, to plug these, these things together here. Then for every x, um, you take this, this function here, uh, you get uh, this here, and then you take this function and plug it in there. So, I'm already at one and uh, like more than one and a half hours, so I will make this short. But you can try to write down the uh, constructive proof for that. It's not too hard. Um, and similar here, this is all like here. I, I said it mirrors uh, Frege uh, axiom Frege. Let's go back to Frege. So this was this this way of uh, if you have this long chain of implications, then we can break it up, right? So given this. Uh, so let's assume, for example, phi is given. We have a reason to believe that. Then it means this implication uh, means that from this we can, can come to this, and this is some, somehow like modus ponum actually. Like from this implication we, and, and this proof of that, we can call the proof of that. And what we have here is is related. So we have this implication for all x, and then we can jump forward here. You can also again with functions you prove that and or give, maybe you find a, a nice like common language example of that mm. and then um the extension extension uh, quantifier so here, here we have this there uh, like exists at least one or maybe i'd also read that as some you know there, there are some x for which this and um you might think of the um the universal quantifier, you know, this, this says for all x holds some, some property. You, you can also like think of that as a, like this, if your domain of discourse is infinite, it's this infinite chain of ends, you know. Uh, for this element, this property holds and for the other element, the property holds and for the other element, and this goes for all, like it's an infinite chains of ends. And in the same sense, you can uh, think of the existential quantification as an infinite chain of ors, you see. Uh, either it holds for that, or, uh, or it holds for that, or it holds for that, or it holds for that. Right? There's at least one for which it holds, and that's exactly what it means to say uh, there exists some. Um, and uh, in that way, um, good. This is this is the the statement here. Um, and okay, da da da. And and in that way, it relates to the Morgan's law. I, I didn't open the Wikipedia page with the, law, the Morgan's law, but you can also like uh, look at that. Uh, this, uh, uh, like this negation uh, relation between um, or and and. And uh, classically, the you can define the existential quantification as not for all not. And this is this mirrors exactly the Morgan's law with the interpretation that I just uh, gave you with this infinite chains. Um, and uh, the constructive reading of existential quantification is that indeed you have a particular element and then a proof for whatever property holds there. Um, and um, otherwise, uh, why would why would that make sense? Um, so uh, I, th I think it the easiest way is I, I wonder I have I not written down this. Yeah, okay. So if we go to the disjunction. Axiom, right? So this was similar. The, you, we are, here we have this B implication. We have this or, like with this, like an existential quantification over either, like over a, a very small domain of just two things. Um, and then we have here this this end. This is this for all, and and we have some implication. And this is basically this sort of infinite version of it over the whole domain. Right? Previously, this was the, the xi, and this was split into two. This is like where before we had two, now we have an, an, um, an infinite and schema, another, and you know, another infinite sequence of this, 
of these uh, predicates and the justification is similar to to the other one um where in the classically uh, you have to use explosions in 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 various directions or otherwise um functional and uh, yeah. Uh, like functional readings of what it means if it holds for all and so on. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> um, yeah, and finally, uh, this is this is the same basically. It's the same for like this this sort of weakening that we had before, where we say two for all quantifier doesn't change the truth of this to the first one where, where it's bounded and indeed this is also a quantifier so this acts in a similar way if this is already bounded then you can go with the quantifier of it and it doesn't change the truth of it anymore oh, my voice is slowly dying let's see if i can go two or thirty <laughs> okay so yeah um okay generally again I, I said this in the beginning there is like a, this theory of equality and a lot of it ca can be said in in this presentation i already mix in as they do on metamorph the the binary membership predicate okay so this is particular here um in uh, if you're interested in the martin Löw type theoretical interpretation um or, or other dependent uh, type interpretations with of logic with equality you take um, this one property of equality namely the reflexivity that, that a thing is the, the thing itself right right uh, uh, the bottle is the bottle uh, I am me um, and you take this uh, I guess the, is this uh, evident uh, like this is an, an axiom which and an axiom in this type theoretic interpretation is this proof term and then it has a particular name namely refer and this is actually for every x in your domain of this course you get this refer right so for example if you take the number three the number three is the number three and the proof of that like is reflexivity classically speaking or in this constructive approach is this refer of three so refer is a function that maps any element to a proof that the element is itself okay we're going to use this a little bit here okay okay so firstly um this is um the this this axiom of existence and here the the like on the one hand since we're going to talk about set theories and we are going to have at least two elements and much more infinite ele elements really in our interpretation uh, this is not really here uh, very interesting, uh, although if you just axiomize logic as such um, then and you want to prove like general logical theorems, then you might want to assert that your domain of this course is not empty and you, you might exert, uh, assert that there is, exists at least one element that sometimes this is done completely implicitly, like people just assume that you don't talk about a theory which is simply empty. Um, Explicitly here, this is stated, uh, but this statement in the meta math at least gets a little bit complicated because of these two levels. Like here's the first time this this uh, for all for any set variable um, holds that there exists the statement, and this is then the like uh, the scheme of axioms that there exists at least uh, one thing. Um, I mean, this is basically validated by the fact that for any element, for example, for any for for any um, cup, you have that the cup is you have you have that there, there is a cup that is equal to it, and the thing that exists is the one that you started with basically. Right? For every for every thing, there is a thing, namely itself, that is equal to it. Um, this is the like this is this basic statement that is uh, then made here. Although in in this um, meta uh, split between the, the the statement which is made for, there exists something with this property this is in the object language and then the, then this is in the meta language so this can like very technically speaking get complicated but the claim that is behind this is uh, very trivial this is just the axiom the claim that something exists and similarly the the constructive interpretation of it if we now for a sake of it blend these levels the, the object level and the meta level together then 
default also ju just becomes a lambda term and then this is the proof right for for every y there exists something and exist means as i noted here in the constructive reading of this uh, existential quantification that we need this pair and that the pair is the thing that uh, has a per certain property and in this case this is this right for every y there exists an x namely y uh, such that this holds and why does it hold? Well, if uh, X is Y, then this just says Y is Y. And the proof of that is the reflectivity property. So this is the proof of the statement, the justification anyway. Um, okay, and here make a note about this, this uh, distinctive, like, uh, okay. Again, this is like this, if, if, since we want to get a Z theory, it's no problem to say there exist 14 things or more. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so and and then it goes on with these trivialities, like trivialities in the sense that you have, of course, you have to maximize them. But if you have or, like already twenty years of working with equality on your back, then uh, this will not face you or surprise you in any way. Uh, for all parameters holds that if uh, x and y is the same, then if x is the same as the third, then because x is y, y is also the same as the third. Right? Okay. This is the uh, transitivity property uh, next to symmetry property, one of the defining properties of equality. And if in symmetry property, like x and y is y, so y and x, if you plug in uh, the same variable, then you have reflexity property. Yeah, okay, here I have this anchored form. If x is y and x is z, then y is z. Wow. <laughs> um, okay. And you will probably find more of these like super trivial laws, like there's then also more interesting laws like Leibniz law and this kind of basic logic laws of equality of substitution. Okay, uh, yeah, so here, the, like the comment I make here is that um, this is a sort of a special case of, of this, this rule, like if X is Y, then from P of X follows P of Y, where I've used the um, argument brackets notation with a particular p p here in this case is like p of x is x equals z right um and um with other p other um statements follow like we would say this is per substitution true for everything but since we are just dealing with equality and, and uh, membership um predicates here which are these two um predicates are these two um, expressions that we use for set theory in first order logic. Um, we, do, we are explicitly here and we do not just for general P, but we do it here in this explicit way. So if you plug in P of X equals X is element of set, then we get this statement. Okay. If X is Y, then if X is in Z, then Y is in Z. It's clear if you substitute, this is basically the substitution rule. And similarly, uh, if this X and Y are on the other side of the of the membership predicate. Okay. Um, and then here also, this is all this this, this membership uh, things. This is like a, like a an odd formal way of speaking about um, symmetry together with substitution. What you can do with that. Um, and the here this this. So whenever it goes, gets to substitution in this context, it's a little bit confusing because it maximizes in a complicated way something you would do anyhow. Um, but since we are two hours, let me not dwell on that too much. Okay, here is, is these uh, rules. Um, you can look also on, on Metamath where everything is super formally proven how these imply other, these other statements. So how we, with modus ponens and some, some of these laws that are discussed in propositional calculus, you get at, at, at something like this, which is maybe more uh, to your liking. Like um, usually like the, the fact that the, the, the name of the quantifier doesn't matter is uh, introduced in logic lecture maybe on university on the side and not as part of the formalism, but here it has to be part of the formalism. And so you get this, this, all these rules. Um, yeah, it's variable substitution and so on. And, and similar here, here, this is like, um, 
this uh, like this is a formalization of saying that uh, these are di like distinct or when they are the same then uh, then the conjunction will be true anyway so this is not only relevant when they are distinct and when they are distinct then um, the, the truth of x being y does not depend on the z which is distinct from them okay again this is like this schmafu of um, substitutions and a little bit annoying but okay something you would automatically do if you just write it on a piece of paper and, and uh, you don't have this you don't usually formalize it that and yeah and similar this this is similar to that except with the quantifier um, not not in there but these are actually I think this is pro yeah I think the this is like these are highly related anyhow okay okay so uh, Finally, we're over the, the more boring part, to be honest. And now we get to the set theory uh, axioms. I hope I still have the energy to motivate them properly. Most of them are standard, um, but I want to point out where you can be weaker and still have a sensible theory. Okay. So, Okay, we we, um, we start with the ones which are basically always part of uh, set theories. The axiom of extensionality, despite the fact that uh, I read that you can actually do without it, and and if you have like some more like uh, exotic way of treating a quality, um, you, uh, you 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 apparently you don't need it. You can also work with quotients, but this is just a. a a note for the more experts among you. Um, what we already had is that if you have that some things are equal, then you can replace uh, the, the left and right hand side of the equality. Um, you can substitute the this uh, variable names in any properties, right? And uh, so you have if something is equal, then some property of sets can be uh, like rewritten and but how to actually prove equality well the axiom of extensionality tells you when you are actually allowed to do this sort of substitution right once you can consider these two sets to be equal right in the same sense that um, one plus four equals two plus three in arithmetic and you can treat them as the same you can write down um, I don't know one plus two in bracket squared uh, equals 25 and once you have established that one plus two is two plus three, you can also write down two plus three um, in brackets squared is twenty five, and this is the same statement. Like once you have proven that they are they equal, you can substitute them there. But how do you actually get to the fact that they are equal? Do you need some some rules? In the case that I just discussed, that would be piano arithmetic or Heiting arithmetic. And here, the axiom of extensionality says that for any sets exactly when they have all the same elements like if for all elements uh, if they are in one of them if one of these sides is true then the, the other side is also true exactly if they have one they have the same elements then the sets are actually equal and you can uh, use them as just syntactic rewritings of, of one another in the same sense that one plus four is a rewriting of two plus three right so you might say i consider the sets of all um, I don't know, uh, multiples of four <laughs> and uh, you might de now define the same set in some other way. I don't know, the, the set of all f elements that mod four, they are zero and this would be actually be the same set. So these two have the same uh, elements and that means they are equal and, and, and th once you have formally established that they are equal, then you can take these two sets in whatever way you write it down and substitute them in any other predicate. This is the power of equality. Um, okay, then uh, axiom of pairing says, for all sets, there is a set U, okay, this is going to be the pair, such that for all sets, if they are either uh, X or Y, then they are inside of this pair. Right, so 
that essentially means that u is has x and y in it right they are paired into one set again for all sets x and y there is a set the pair uh, such that whenever uh, z is either of those then for sure it is also in the pair okay this is one of the simpler there there are like then other axioms that imply this simple pairing axiom but uh, in this context and this setup that we have here we maximize it like so um, and then axiom of union maybe we read the example before like if you have uh, a set u that is uh well no other way around if you have a set that is a set of sets, then we can flatten it basically to get a set where we can remove this bracket. So this is set builder notation, by the way, again, the set builder notation is uh, explained in another video, but you might know it anyhow. So this says that every set has a set that is a union where all the elements of the sets are in it. So for all sets X, there is a union such that for all uh, the all Y, um then uh if there is a set uh z such that y is in it and z is also in it so for example here this is this the, the big one might be is the set x then there is a set um for all for all y so for example for for this there is a set that's called here uh, z that's in it and y is in z and then there is this u where y is in it so this this basically flattens it pulls everything out of this of this subset okay union these are the these three axioms that i just listed they are like the least controversial axioms now it gets a little bit more complicated okay um so axiom of predicate predicative uh, separation let's just uh, first do just separation and then I explain the predicative part um for all x, uh, there is a set z, which is which, which is going to be uh, smaller than x, um, such that um, y is exactly then in this set z, which is granted to exist, if y is also in x, and if the predicate um, uh, phi holds, and here phi read phi as depending on x. <coughs> um, depending on x, I think it could be not. It should depend on uh, on y as well. So uh, here I say s y of x. I'm not hundred percent sure if x is the right uh, thing here. You can you can check it on Wikipedia. I think this should be y. But uh, in any case, that's a formality. Um, I mean, there's only one right way, but uh, you can look it up. Um, the, the thing is, um, no, this should, this should, that should be why. Um, so uh, what happens here is that you have this um, set X and then you define with the, with the, uh, with a property um, phi, uh, which elements of, of X you want to keep and which elements of uh, you want, don't want to keep and de where, where where this phi of y says true um, then th these elements are actually separated out into this new set z so z is actually a subset of x right um, and i explained this in in detail in the impredicativity video that i did a month ago and now uh, this would be the axiom of separation um, What's nice is that we can say, hey, we actually want to be um, have a weaker axiom, and we obtain a weaker axiom by imposing that these phi's are not any predicates, but that we impose that all quantifiers, so for all exists and for all um, no exists like the, ex the existential quantifier or the universal quantifier, that they be bounded in the sense that I defined at the beginning of this video where I said bounded quantifier means that that uh, we only consider them bounded with respect to some some set right we don't range over the full domain of this course but we won't range only over a particular set um okay and 
But then once you have that, this notion of bounded, then if you want to be formal about it, then you also have to s somehow to, to uh, specify how to actually detect when, some, when something is, is bounded. So if you want to do a formal calculus like they did uh, with Metamath, then you either have to have a machinery to, to extract it from the syntax, or what they actually do there is um, add more axioms for just bounded uh, boundedness. They have like one, one um, property of, of uh, formulas um, that axiomizes the behavior of a formula that is bounded, but it's only one way of getting at it. And again, this, these things are never really uh, discussed much in, in, for example, math papers, even logic papers. Uh, where everything is treated sort of on a, on a syntactical level. I mean, m often anyway. Um, uh, but okay, we have, this will be the only thing where we mention like this, this boundedness condition, but be, be aware that you can uh, make your axioms weaker this way. And weaker is not always bad because it means that it's easier to implement, for example, um, or easier to reflect, e easier to find models that reflect your logic. Uh, but that's another matter. Okay, then axiom, uh, axiom scheme of replacement. This basically says, let me first say it in words, that um, if you have a predicate depending on two parameters, they behave like a function, meaning for every input, there's only one, for every like element in the first uh, slot, uh, there's only one element of the second slot uh, where it holds, then um, if you have this sort of predicate and a set, then uh, you can basically project with this function into a codomain and the codomain will also be a set. Also, I'm get, getting a little bit nervous because um, I'm only at 5% battery now. I hope this will keep on, but uh, maybe I, I manage <laughs> to get get down with the, all the axioms in, in this, in, with this 5%. So um, here it says that for all D, I say D for domains, um, if we have here this this um, this predicate depending on x and y, um, if for all uh, x in the domain there's exactly one y such that this holds, then there exists this this set uh, R which is the range um, where uh, elements exactly in R there should be a small R um, exactly then when these are actually in the domain, this x okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so, um, secondly, then, okay, uh, here discuss like how to model uh, like Cartesian products and which are necessary to model graphs which represent functions in set theory. With the axioms uh, so obtained so far, we can do a lot. We can do like uh, axiomatize. Um, the hereditarily finite sets that I did a video about. Um, we can axiomize um, Cartesian products, uh, index sums, equivalence classes. Even though we don't have, we don't even have a love to the middle and just these few axioms, we can do already a lot of set theory. But our theory so far doesn't have um, actually an infinite set. And uh, what I do here is the following: I say there is one smallest inductive set and an inductive. Uh, set is an infinite set. I, I have this predicate I abstracted here, say like this depends on, on uh, two parameters, x and uh, uh, no, just one parameter. Um, inductive set means a set is inductive. This the set that um, is the argument is, is this w. And the set is inductive if it has the, the empty set in it. And also for every set that is in w, uh, it has the, this set formed by this union, this is so-called successor set. This corresponds to, um, <laughs> wait a minute. This corresponds to um, the uh, like pl plus one function. If, if we consider a um, natural number a model of the natural, uh, natural number model in set theory. Okay, and then uh, the, the axiom of strong infinity says that indeed there is such uh, an inductive set and in particular there is a, the smallest such inductive set. It says there is a set um, W, which will be the, this infinite set. It will be the natural numbers, quotes and quotes, uh, the model of it, such that um, it is inductive and for all sets that are inductive, 
um, they actually have a WS subset. And in that sense, it's the smallest inductive set, right? So there's an infinite set and not only is there an infinite set, there's also this kind of minimal set. This is like a, a, a stronger version of infinity that is helpful to stay in this stronger version, in, especially in the constructive setting there. Um, in the way that I described in which we get um, functions as graphs, which are subsets of Cartesian products, um, we might then uh, exomize that the set and a set exists, which is the, the set which holds all these functions, i.e. a function space. Um, if we define this exponentiation object, and this is what I sort of just described, the expression is also given here, then uh, one way to write it down, um, although it has to be expanded quite a bit because these function spaces are not very native in set theory, um, just says that there is uh, like this h, h, like I wrote h like for like, it kind of mirrors the, um, the home functor in category theory, if you know that. Um, there is like this a set which is exactly the set of functions from x to y. Um, a simpler version of that is if y is like a set with two elements, or take, for example, there's the set of the set of the sets which correspond to zero and one in in arithmetic, then the statement is classically even equivalent to the statement that for every set there is a power set, which is an axiom which is which you can write down very simple. This is also an axiom of Zermelo Frankel set theory. Um, but it's a quite a strong axiom and I, I, I opted to uh, write down this axiom of exponentiation as a weak form, which is not so um, hard to implement or far away from a type theoretic interpretation um, than um, this Zermelo Frankel axiom. In particular, the, the, this axiom set that I just list, they can be, this, it can be interpreted in, in a Martin Löw type theory. I made a short video, a rough video about this as well. Um, and then finally, this is our, uh, like the, the last interesting axiom, and then I will list some stronger axioms. The axiom scheme of induction. So this is basically like induction for natural numbers. It says that uh, eventually I can, uh, enables me to prove a statement for all sets and the condition to prove a statement for all sets. Basically the idea is that you do, uh, like the, the idea is that with this axiom, we axiomatize that our set theory uh, is pure set theory where everything is a set and everything trickles down um, to just being sets of sets of sets of sets that on the bottom just have empty sets. Everything is like a bag, a nested bag. Um, and so this says that you can actually start at, at the empty set, you know, for all elements in the empty set, everything's true. And you work yourself up, you, you prove something for the empty set, you prove something for some set that has just the empty set in it. And then you prove something for the set, which just has maybe the empty set in it or the, just, the set I just mentioned. And um, you have this sort of upwards induction. So this says that if for all sets, um, you can prove that for all sets in that set, the statement being true uh, on one level in deeper inside implies it that it also holds for the for the full set. You know, an example of this would be um, uh, okay. You, you, you like if you know von Neumann um, uh, universes. This is like this, this sets um, obtained with the power set operation. If you say um, if uh, all sets, like if all sets in a sets are in in a Neumann universe, then they're also in then the set itself, which holds the sets, is also part of this the same universe. And uh, this would be such an upwards claim. Okay, a um, little bit abstract. Uh, if you can improve, like prove that something holds, something holding for all elements of a set implies that it holds for the set itself. Right, then the axiom says the axiom basically says everything is just this sets bottom up. Then that, that indeed holds for all sets, i.e., all sets are are made of this this upwards building form. This is like implicitly um, axiomized in this way. Uh, I have to note that there is this so-called uh, axiom of regularity, which is a little bit 
it's probably even harder to read. Um, but which axiomatizes the same thing. The only difference is that the axiom of regularity implies law of excluded middle, and that's why I chose to write on this axiom instead. Both of these axioms have Wikipedia pages if you're interested. Okay, here I give, <coughs> you may read that, the comparison with, um, with the uh, piano arithmetic induction rule, which can be written in a very sim uh, similar fashion. So if you look at that, how this mirrors uh, yeah, this normal induction axiom on here, this is an n too much. Um, yeah, okay, so here we have now um, a bunch of uh, axioms. Uh, we, we could now add a stronger collection axioms and subset collection and what have what have I written down more. We, yeah. we could end up with a, a bunch of things that uh, would still be interpretable in type theories. Or we might also add the full power set axiom and separation scheme for any, not just bounded. Um, uh, bounded uh, will form formulas and we might uh, then go on and assume, for example, the axiom of regularity implying law of excluded middle. And then we would have like Zemmler Frankel, right? So this is the path to go, but for a lot of math, only these, these sort of axioms are really necessary. Maybe if you want to argue about some uh, very non-constructive real analysis stuff, then you need a strong collection and these kind of things. Um, okay, uh, so this was uh, the part that I, want to I wanted to cover at least for my axioms. Firstly, the law of excluded middle. Again, this is implied by the axiom of regularity. It's also implied by the axiom of choice that we're going to discuss next. Here, this thing, uh, like you can try, um, is hard to interpret constructively with the interpretations that I gave at the beginning of this video, right? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, the axiom of choice says that for any set X, Unless it's the empty set, then it doesn't apply. But if, if uh, some uh, set X is not the empty set or it's not empty, let's say, here you might say, there's a constructive distinction, by the way, between uh, being the empty set uh, or being inhabited. But um, I'm not going to get into that uh, right now at the end of this video. So that says that there, there like it's not just claims there exists a function from a set X into the union of X, which for each element of x, you know, for each u of x, if you apply it to that, picks an element from this. So you imagine x being a, a set of sets, and there are like a, a bajillion sets in x, and for every one of these sets, f is a function that reaches into the set and picks picks one element. This is the axiom of choice, it chooses one. This is also equivalent in the value ordering uh, theorem, which then says, all sets can be well ordered, although I have to add that uh, provably you cannot write down these value orderings for most cases. For example, the, you can prove that, like a value ordering is this ordering with a smallest element. You can prove with the axiom of choice the real numbers are well orderable, but it's impossible to actually write it down like this order. Um, yeah, okay. This existence property is broken. Let's be, the, the, the notion of description is gets problematic then. Um, then finally, almost finally, uh, the Tarski axiom, which says that every um, every set in your domain of discourse has what's called a uh, Grotendieck axiom, which is a uh, Grotendieck universe. A Grotendieck universe is a set in which to this x uh, embeds and gives like a whole context that's a gigantic, a gigantic new set. This is this universe. Uh, and of course, then the Grotnik axiom also applies them to this universe, like to this universe as the universe is in, is in a bigger universe and so on and so forth. And it says the following. For every um, X holds that there is a universe U um, and the universe U has this property, X is in the universe for all elements of uh, the universe, <laughs> the, the uh, all subsets of the element is also a subset of the universe. 
hence the power set of this element is also in the universe. So that like is is very full <laughs> um, because this power set operation gives you a lot of sets, and they are they are all on, on some level inside and um, on the same level as this U. Uh, the, the X is also in U, so this provides this huge context. And then, okay, for all elements in the power set of the universe, so for all subsets of the universe, um, if the subset is not at the same cardinality as the universe itself, i.e. if it's smaller, then this is also in there. So everything that's in the universe that's smaller than the universe, like every subset of the universe that's smaller than the universe is also an element of the universe. So it's a huge, huge set. It's a large cardinal axiom. And if you have that, then you can more easily speak about categories and so on. You don't have to do on class level stuff. Okay, um, but this is of course super strong and implies then uh, other wild existence statements. And finally, uh, we can take some false uh, statement. So this is, for example, provable that's not the case, not, uh, especially like if you have this strong logic. And once you have a false statement, like there's something in the empty set or zero is one, then you have explosion and then you can prove everything. So then you have a trivial logic and this is our final axiom. So, okay, I hope the, the, the video recording didn't break down like um, 20 minutes ago because uh, I ran out of uh, battery for a moment. Um, but yeah, this completes that. Um, sorry for this super long video, I should have known. Uh, I hope I hope I was more or less enthusiastic of it uh, to the end. Um, I might make another video on uh, more, uh, one or two proofs actually as they are in the metamorph so that you can connect them to actual formal proofs. Although the the whole substitution and, and uh, meta and theorem scheme um, is a little bit more exotic uh, given that uh, type theory is usually the hot shit at the moment. So I'm, I might more stick with these uh, concepts. But let's see, let's see. Um, this is uh, mathematics. <laughs> um, I uh, admit I have not said too much about, about uh, Topoi. I actually wanted to um, shine more light on the connections uh, to Topoi. For example, the way I presented it, the way I talked about the exp like explicitly stated the exponentiation axiom more in this kind of categorical framework where in type theory and category theory, it's easier to build, for example, um, define exponents, exponents of, of uh, objects or exponential objects easier than, than sub-objects, for example, while in set theory, na naturally, membership and, and subset properties are easier to define. Um, I didn't talk too much about these, these relations, uh, which is not to say I don't like, like these other frameworks, but you will definitely find more information about set theories. Okay, so um, let's stick under two hours and a half. Uh, that was that. Uh, you will find the, this document in uh, on, on the bottom. You can also uh, like copy paste out this this axiom if you're interested in in, in a one one of these frameworks, which is was what I just wanted to provide with this video. And with that, I say goodbye. Have a nice evening.